Well, as we jump in here today, let's um, take the bigger view of where we've been and where we're going. This is week nine out of 10 weeks in this series, The Present Future, Becoming Who God is Calling Us to Be. And as we're unpacking this, we're looking at a couple of um, important things. And in the, first, uh, in the first two-thirds or so, we covered two big shifts that are happening in the missional church. Now, the missional church is um, the church in today's culture that's thinking about how do we carry out this work that God is calling us to do. And the two big shifts that we've been thinking about are this. The first shift was from an internal focus to an external focus. In other words, as the church, we are realizing that the purpose of the church is not so that we can have our own little thing here, but more importantly, our primary focus is we are called together as the church to be doing God's work in the world. That's our first and primary focus, that God calls us together in order to send us out. So shifting from being an internally focused to an externally focused body of believers. The second shift is how we go about um, growing people in the faith. And the old approach really was a program-driven approach, which meant the church has certain programs and we, we wanna just get people through those programs and if they go through them, they'll be good church members. The goal isn't to create good church members. The, the reason that we grow here together is so that we can become who God wants us to be to impact the world. So the focus then shifts from um, being program driven to be focusing on people development. How do you and I, each one of us, um, grow, be transformed, become who God wants us to be? That, part of that's discovering our gifts. Part of that's discovering our call. Part of that is is realizing the ways that we need to be um, transformed and renewed. But it's saying we're not, we're not focusing on cranking people out through our programs, but rather we're focused on meeting people where they're at and helping them to live into the life that God wants for them. So from program-driven to people development. Okay, so those are two big shifts in the way we think about church. So now, um, in these last few weeks, the focus shifts to, um, from a leadership perspective, so now what? What do we do about this, and what are the implications? And last week, you may remember, um, we said there's an important thing we need to really say is our foundation, and that is, we don't do the big picture planning. We're not the planners. God is. We believe firmly that God holds all things from the beginning to the end, that God has a plan, and our job as God's people is to be prepared to follow, be prepared to put to, to make happen. Now, we also said that being, that doesn't mean that we just sit and wait. We do a lot of things to be prepared. But ultimately, the big picture is God's, not ours. The other way we said it was like this. We said, you know, it's typical for us as people to sort of make plans, and then our prayer to God is, God, please bless my plans, right? I've got these things that I want to have happen, and our usual approach is to say, okay, God, please make my things go the way I want them to go, right? And we pray that in all sorts of ways almost every day, don't we, right? The shift is to say, instead of praying that way, it's to say, God, would your will be done today, right? As we pray in the Lord's Prayer, thy will be done. So it's shifting that and recognizing that God has a plan, and our job is to be receptive to God's plan rather than trying to force our own agenda and say, God, please make my plan work. Okay, you get that? So now today, what is this all about? This week, what we wanna do is look at how Jesus trained the disciples and sent them out. And then we, in that process, we consider how the church today can equip our mission partners to fulfill our mission in everyday life. And of particular importance here is thinking about in leadership. How do we equip our people so that we are the ones on the front lines in our communities, in our wider world, making an impact, making a difference, bringing the kingdom to life? And so we start by looking at what Jesus did with the disciples in today's passage. And by the end of this, we're gonna come around to what's unfolded in Paris this weekend. And, and I want to bring to life in an important way how what we're talking about here connects with that, okay? So bear with me. So let's look at the beginning of this passage. Though. We read, Jesus called his 12 disciples together and gave them authority to cast out evil spirits and heal every kind of disease and illness. And he said to them, go and announce to God's lost sheep that the kingdom of heaven is near. Heal the sick, raise the dead, 
cure those with leprosy and cast out demons. Give as freely as you have received. Okay, there's a lot in those verses, isn't there? And most of those things are probably things that we go, well, I don't think I can do that. So let's dive in here a little deeper and understand what the call is and how this connects with us. So from a bigger picture, what did Jesus say that he came to do? He came to give us life and give it to us abundantly, that we might have life. And if you look at what Jesus' ministry was about, he was constantly giving life. Now, you can think about that in lots of different categories. You can think about it in healing of sickness. You can think about it in giving life by freeing people from addictions. You can think about giving life in the way that we heal wounds of grief, um, wounds of hurt. But Jesus was about giving life. In contrast, Ultimately, what does human sin tend to be around? Human sin takes life. We take life from each other all the time. In the words that we say, the looks that we give, the things we ignore, we are always taking life. I find this to be a helpful way to think about um, who we're called to be as Christ followers. In general, instead of being life takers, we're called to be life givers. And in a broad way, that's what Jesus is sending the disciples to do here. He's saying, go out and do these things. Go and give life. Now, in an important way in this particular passage, Jesus is really sending them on a training mission. See, up to this point, they've been called his disciples. And a disciple is one who is learning to be like the master, right? They've been learning to be like Jesus. Now, um, we skipped over the second verse in this passage, which then calls them apostles. So their names go, they go from being referred to as disciples to being referred to as apostles. And I want to say to you that we should think of ourselves as disciples and apostles. So let's understand those two words. So a disciple is one who follows. We're learning to be like Jesus. But an apostle is one who is sent. Okay, an apostle is sent as an ambassador on behalf of. We are sent on behalf of Jesus, on behalf of God, to implement his mission. Okay, and so these disciples will from now on be known as disciples and apostles, which we too should consider ourselves. We're learning to be like Jesus, but we're also actively his ambassadors in the world. And so they go out on this mission, and in many ways, like I said, this is a training mission. Because this is just, this is a short, it's like a short-term mission trip. I'm going to send you guys out for a while. I want you to go be be life-givers in these communities But this isn't the final time he's sending them out. He's going to bring them back and they're going to continue to learn from him before ultimately he goes to heaven and sends them. But what happens in a training mission like this? There's successes and failures. There's highs and lows, right? There's celebrations and disappointments. And this is like how we practice our faith every day. Sometimes we have great successes in living out our faith and sometimes we have failures. Sometimes we have great highs to celebrate and sometimes lows, celebrations and disappointments. But the point is, putting it into practice, we learn and we grow. So no doubt the disciples come back from this training mission, not only having done God's work, but also having a sense of how they need to continue to grow. Also having a sense of the bigger picture of what they're really called to. I think it's the same way for us. As we step out in faith, as we take risks, we learn and we grow. We also realize more and more the bigger picture of how much this world is hurting, of how much this world needs more life givers, of how much more this world needs the light of God to be piercing the darkness. We learn these things as we put them into practice, right? Isn't it true that we often, um, when we think about stepping out and taking a risk for faith, usually the things that hold us back are, well, maybe I need to learn more first, or maybe I need some more time to study the scriptures, or maybe I need to, and we have all these excuses that usually center around thinking that we're not enough, that we're not ready yet. And the point here is Jesus sends us as apostles even while we're disciples, Now, I also want you to notice what happens here in the verses that follow because Jesus also is a realist. 
and he lets them know about the situation they're walking into, right? So what does he tell them in 16 and 17? He says, look, I'm sending you out as sheep among wolves. So be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. But beware, for you will be handed over to the courts and will be flogged with whips in the synagogues. You will stand trial before governors and kings because you are my followers. Now, it's hard for us to connect that with our lives today, isn't it? We live in a country where we get to practice our faith and we don't have to be afraid of being arrested for practicing our faith. So we have to make some translating into our, into our, into our context today. But certainly, in other parts of the world, this is the reality for Christians, right? In the Middle East, Christians are being exterminated. They're being exterminated right now. In other places in the world, it's not safe to publicly practice the Christian faith. So we don't, we don't have that kind of persecution. And yet, all of us have felt that um, judgment when we have stepped out in faith, when we've tried to practice our faith. All of us maybe have felt that pressure of, can I, in our workplaces or in our families, can I say something from a faith perspective Will that be received? Will that be okay? Will I be judged, right? We've, we've felt those kinds of pressures and those are real things. And so Jesus is speaking into that situation. He's saying, listen, if you are gonna follow me and if you're gonna live this out, it's not always gonna be easy. It's not always gonna be well-received. It's not gonna be appreciated all the time. And in some ways, you may actually face staunch pushback. That's part of the reality. We know what that feels like at school, at work, sometimes in our families or in our neighborhoods. Sometimes we face a hostile environment to what we believe is good news, what we believe is hope and light and peace. What do we do about that? Well, Jesus finishes the passage with some important promises. So hear this. He says, when you are arrested, and for us it's when you face this opposition, don't worry about how to respond or what to say. God will give you the right words at the right time. For it's not you who will be speaking. It will be the spirit of your father speaking through you. Right? Ultimately, Jesus reminds us that this isn't about our own strength or power. Remember the promise in Acts that we speak of often here. Jesus says, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you. The whole idea here is that ultimately when we step forward in faith, it's all about God and not about us. So having the words at that moment ultimately isn't about if you've got the words. It's about trusting that God will give you the words. That God will give you the words. Now again, notice though the way that Jesus talked about what this looked like. He said, he said that you need to be as shrewd as snakes and as harmless as doves. What's he getting at? He's saying that, listen, as Christians, we're... We, we're bright people. We've been given gifts. We need to face the reality of the world and understand um, that we need to be street smart. And we need to approach um, the issues that we see in our communities and in our workplaces and in our schools. We need to approach these things wisely, intentionally. We need to, we need to plan for these things and do these things well. But when he says as harmless as doves, what he means is we don't do an eye for an eye. We don't do that kind of stuff. We don't respond in the same way that we're treated. So we move forward boldly, courageously, confidently, but always harmless as doves. We don't do harm. We bring light. We bring peace. We bring love. So as I was, um, my sermon was finished, and then Paris happened, and I said, well now, we, don't, we can't ignore this, Right? And then I saw a quote from um, Mr. Rogers, Fred Rogers, and some of you maybe saw I shared this on Facebook, but I think this is important. And actually, maybe you know this, Mr. Rogers was an ordained clergy person. He was a pastor. But he said this. He said, when I was a boy and I would see scary things in the news, my mother would say to me, look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. Look for the helpers. You will always find people who are helping. My friends, that's us. That's us. We're the helpers. We are the light in the darkness. 
We are the hope and the peace and the love in the midst of hatred. That's us. The message there from Mr. Rogers is that when you look at the world and you, and you are tempted to be overcome by fear or anger or um, worry, to remember that, oh no, darkness is not winning. Evil is not winning. There is more good in the world than there is evil. No doubt about it. And if you look, you will see the helpers. You will see the helpers. We can't solve all the world's problems and we don't um, overcome evil uh, 100% in this life. But the point is that we are called to speak against that evil, to confront that evil. We are called to bring light into darkness. That's what we're called to do and be. Now, most of us, we pray, will never be in that kind of a crisis situation as the people in Paris were. And as many in our own country were in New York City on 9-11. Most of us, we hope and pray, will never be in that kind of situation. But, but we see little crises all the time, don't we? We see darkness breaking into people's lives. We see people who are facing hopelessness, despair, hurt. We see this all the time. And who is it that brings love into those situations? Who is it that brings light into that darkness? Well, we do. You and I, we do. We're the ones. That's what we get to do. When we say we are Jesus' hands and feet, we are God's presence, that's what we mean. Now, it's in moments like that where people with moral clarity step forward. It's in moments like that where people who have the spirit of the living God inside of them Jump to action. It's in moments like that where people empowered by the Holy Spirit have words that they don't know where they came from. But in this passage today, Jesus sends the disciples on a training mission to be practicing it already. And you and I, my friends, we are called to practice this in everyday life, to live it out in little ways so that we also may live it out in big ways. Now, in just a few short weeks, we are going to be doing visioning sessions as a congregation, dreaming about the future that God is calling us to. And part of that visioning is being aware of the issues in our community and issues in the larger world. Now, we do not for a moment pretend that somehow we're going to... Um, we're going to solve all of the problems in our community or in the world. But certainly we are called to address them in some ways and, or specific things. But in a bigger way, you and I are sent to be leaders in our community addressing these things, whether it's as part of the church or part of everyday life. And this is what I, what I want to challenge you with today, this theme around leadership, that the church needs to be equipping we need to be equipping you to be the ones who are on the front lines making things happen. So, when we discover that someone in our community is newly paralyzed and needs a ramp so that they can get into their home, who is it that steps forward and builds it? We do. We do. When we discover that a single mom in our community has just lost her job and is going to lose her place to live, who steps forward and does something about it? We do. When we discover that a neighbor has lost a loved one, who comes to their door with hugs or food or an ear? We do. We do. But what about issues like mental illness? Who's addressing those things? Well, I don't know that we as a church do, but maybe that's what God's called you to do. Maybe God has called you to do something about that, to be a leader in moving, moving the ball forward. We as the church are called to be leaders in our community, bringing the kingdom to life. We are called to be the ones who give life, to be light bearers. So again, in some ways, we as a church, 
We'll tackle issues in our community and we will come together to do something. But in other ways, you may be called in a completely different kind of way to be on the front lines doing God's work. What we're doing now is we're saying we as a church need to equip you, help equip you so, you're, so you can step forward. And we as a congregation need to keep discerning about how we do this and, and what, how we're called in a bigger way. The world around us is hurting and we're called to be life givers. So how is God calling you to be a life giver? Right now, how is God calling you to give life this week, this month, this year? How, God, how is God calling you to be a life giver? Let's pray. Gracious God. Again, Lord, we come before you lifting the people in Paris trusting that your powerful spirit is present in an incredible life-giving way. But God, we pray that even now you are working in us so that we may be the life-givers in our own community. Lord, we pray that you give us courage and strength to step forward to be the leaders, to be the teachers, to be the coaches, to be the visitors, to be the planners, to be the leaders, to be those who step forward to be the ones that bring light into darkness, to be the ones who bring hope into despair. Help us to be life givers. In Jesus' name we pray these things.